My name is Karen James. I'm a member of faculty at the MDI Bio Lab, and it is my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Miriam Goldstein. Miriam is both an outstanding scientist and also an outstanding science communicator, which I know is no pressure. <laughs> she, she will be demonstrating tonight. Um, and is also a friend of mine. Uh, Miriam is currently a Naus Kenaus Sea Grant Fellow, and she's working with the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Natural Resources (parentheses Democrats) <laughs> and previously got her Ph.D. at Scripps Institute of Oceanography about a year and a half ago, and then she did her undergraduate research at her undergraduate degree at Brown. And she is originally from Manchester, New Hampshire, so not far from right here. And tonight she's going to be telling us about plastic pollution in the ocean and all kinds of things related to that. And I think we'll be dispelling a few myths as well about plastics in the ocean. So without further ado, Dr. Miriam Goldstein. Thank you all so much for coming. And how's my volume there in the back? Good. 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 Excellent. Um, I usually err towards more the loud side, so that's convenient. Uh, do we want to give away those two seats? Yeah, there are two, two, more, two more, more seats, seats right here if anybody long. wants to take them. Yeah. And I would also like to take this opportunity oh, yeah. to say something I forgot to say, which is that Dr. Goldstein is also giving a research seminar tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock at the BioLab um, in the Marin Auditorium on a similar topic that you'll be hearing about tonight, but with more of a science uh, research angle. And that is open if anybody wants to come to that. There should be some more flyers about that on the table outside. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, today I'm going to give, and probably talk for about 15 to 20 minutes on the actual Great Pacific Garbage Patch, where people think the garbage patch is, and some ways that we can start to deal with the large amount of plastic that is in our oceans. Um, please, if you have questions at any time, uh, feel free to interrupt. This is very informal. I might say, oh no, I have a slide about that coming up, so don't be insulted if I do that. But please do feel free at any time to just raise your hand if you have a question. Oh, and uh, if any of you are uh, upon the social media, there's a hashtag that if you have questions, you can also use on Twitter, if any of you are into Twitter. Um, and I can answer questions on that after the talk, although unfortunately not while I'm talking, not quite that advanced. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, plastic pollution is everywhere in the ocean these days. And this comes out of the fact that plastic is a fantastic material. It's very light, very lightweight very durable and doesn't isn't subject to rot and rust and because of that same resistance to the elements it also persists for a long time in the environment um, so pretty much no matter where you go the coasts coral reefs this is a picture from the deep sea um, around a couple miles down um, you see the plastic trash that has not been properly disposed of and has made its way into the ocean and this has led to some dramatic effects on wildlife, which is the negative effects that most people are most familiar with. The picture of a heron here is a famous one uh, with a six pack ring on its neck um, because, and led to a lot of people, including myself, always cutting their six pack rings. Although there is, a, if you actually throw it away in the landfill, it really shouldn't make its way into a heron's neck, but I still do it anyway. Um, and you also get entanglement issues with fishing related gear. Um, this is a Hawaiian monk seal which is endangered and a sea turtle which ran into some monofilament. Um, and you have habitat effects, a bunch of trash on a coral reef and this is a bunch of trash behind this albatross chick that has washed up on the northwest Hawaiian islands. And that sometimes this leads to really sad dramatic effects like this albatross chick which had ingested a large amount of plastic that is fed to it by its parents. But there are other effects in the open ocean that are much harder to see. And this is what people term the Great Pacific Garbage Patch um, because it gets stuck in the middle of the ocean. So I'll briefly explain why it gets stuck there. Um, this is unfortunately a little washed out, but it shows the circulation of the surface ocean throughout the world. And if it wasn't so washed out, you see there are big circular features 
here, and those are what are called the subtropical gyres. And there are five of them, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North Pacific, South Pacific, and Indian. And these are natural formations of the currents that are formed by the way the winds blow across the globe and by the way the earth turns. So we have one right off the coast of Maine here, North Atlantic Gyre. Um, part of that's the famous Sargasso Sea. What I'm going to mostly talk about in this is the Pacific because that's where I work, but I did want to show you all of them. And in the Pacific, there's this big clockwise movement of the water. So when you zoom in, um, it looks like this. So here's Hawaii, here's California, Oregon, and Washington, just to orient you. And the colors are the winds. Um, so red and orange, a lot of wind, blue and white, not so much wind. And you have the winds moving along with the waters to interact to form this big white calm spot right here. Um, that's the North Pacific High, if any of you are sailors. Um, and that is where air trash tends to collect. In the middle of that big North Pacific gyre circulation, there's even a calmer spot. And that's what people call either the Eastern Garbage Patch or the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Floating material gets stuck there. So um, because of this and because of the amazing work of many nonprofits, including many who have heard of Charles Moore, he has been particularly important in raising awareness of these issues. Um, but uh, this work got sort of filtered through the media into headlines like this. Hmm, maybe I should stand over here. I'm sorry. To the, um, can I block on the screen if I do this? OK. Um, so the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, it is a cleanup hazard, but twice the size of America, and uh, Hawaii to Japan, and 3.5 million something. We don't even know what in this headline. So think of, if it's 3.5 billion, definitely sounds like a lot. So, so things got kind of confused in the media. Um, and that's how I got interested in this issue earlier in grad school. Um, some years ago, I started seeing these headlines and I was like, well, if there really was a garbage dump twice the size of America, couldn't you see it on satellite and wouldn't someone have noticed? And 3.5 million, what exactly? Um, so that's how I got interested in this issue. Um, and I looked in the scientific literature and there wasn't really a lot of information. Um, and so other people, when they saw those headlines, have taken sort of more literal interpretations of it because there wasn't a lot of other information to go by. So this saying there's a floating garbage dump twice the size of America was interpreted like there's a actual large thing you can walk on. So uh, these are some pictures that if you Google Great Pacific Garbage Patch, you will see. Um, this is a graphic novel uh, called Great Pacific. Our hero, Chaz Worthington, uh, goes and claims it uh, for his own country, termed New Texas. Uh, <laughs> he also wrestles a giant octopus. But I think he later becomes friends with the octopus. So there's a lot that goes on. But uh, you can see he's standing on this island. Um, again, this is a more artistic graphic novel where the garbage patch is sad and lonely because nobody loves a garbage patch. This is a picture of term canoe guy, um, which is a guy canoeing through a large amount of trash, which is true. It's a real picture, but it's from a canal in Manila. It's not from the middle of the ocean. <laughs> and this is from a uh, short film narrated by Werner Herzog about a sad and lonely plastic bag which wants to go to the magical island of plastic bags to live with its friends, which I do highly recommend. It's a great short film, but this is how the island of plastic bag is portrayed. So these are, these leads people to ask, where is the island of trash? Why can't I see it on Google Earth? Uh, for those of you who might be boaters, I, who end up sit, going across the Pacific, why did you miss the giant island of trash? Um, and the reason that you missed it is because it looks like this. Yeah. Uh, this is a picture that I myself took in the middle of the garbage patch um, in 2010. So the ocean looks like ocean, in fact, quite a nice ocean. Uh, but when you look closer, you start to see that there is a lot, a fair amount of trash out there. There are large items, like this is a ghost net that was about the size of a small bus. Um, it's a big hairball of lost or discarded fishing gear, so a bunch of different nets and buoys <coughs> floating around, and those can be extremely hazardous to wildlife because Fishing nets don't stop fishing just because they're not attached to a boat anymore. This particular one didn't have uh, too much entangled in it, but it can occur that whales and dolphins and turtles and valuable fish get stuck in them and die and are wasted. 
Um, we also did see uh, plastic drink bottles. These are drink bottles with barnacles, goose, gooseneck barnacles growing on them. And, but most of it is these little tiny pieces of trash, these tiny white flecks floating on the surface. And I'll show you a zoomed in picture of those. Oh, except first I'll show you a few more pictures. Uh, so drink bottles, a lot of, uh, this is a crate floating by the ship. That's a buoy with a big corona of barnacles. That's our ship in the background. It is not trash. It's a very nice ship. Um, so this is a picture that I took looking right down from the bridge of the ship. Oh, that's why I had that slide. Okay, uh, this is a pic, that, so here's the, this is a picture I took basically standing here and looking straight down. Um, so about, you know, I don't know, the size of a coffee table or this area up here. Not a very large area. So I'm going to give you mm, 10 seconds and to count all the pieces of trash you see in this picture. And I do, I do apologize that it's a little washed out, so it's not quite fair, but oh well. All right, ready? Go. <laughs> Go. Okay. Okay, uh, I heard a 12 and what else? 14, what else? 15, 14, 15, 14 10,000, 10, 19. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, what I at least I saw um, 23 or but probably more because there are probably some just below the surface that I can't see. And so this is the real nature of the garbage patch. It's these tiny little flecks of plastic floating around on the surface that you cannot easily see with your eyes, but when you collect them with the net, then it becomes it becomes what people have termed plastic soup. It's a very large amount of very small pieces, which I brought in a vial, so I'll pass them around so you can see what they look like. These are ones that we picked up off the surface um, in 2009. Um, so you can see these tiny little pieces and what they look like. So I'll just pass that around. And so um, this is what happens. This jar right here is what happens when you tow around a net on the surface and filter about an Olympic swimming pool size amount of water. So that's concentrated from a swimming pool into a little jar. And then that, that are, these are all these little pieces floating on the surface. So that's what you get um, in these very plasticky areas. Uh, they're the same size as sea life. So he, these are little jellyfish called Valella Valella or by the wind sailors. Really awesome jellyfish. They have like a little sail and they sail with the wind on the surface of the ocean. Very charming jellyfish. Um, they don't sting either. Uh, so, uh, but they're the same size as these pieces of plastic. So the plastic is the same size as the zooplankton that is the critical link in the ocean between the plants, the phytoplankton, and the fish that we all like to eat and catch and for them to just be there in general. Um, again, so here's the plastic compared to some of the fish. This is a Pacific sari, a very important bait fish. And again, the plastic is also the same size as them. This is a uh, larval flying fish and a euphausid or krill. So the big issue with this is that this plastic is the same size as some of the prey items um, that particularly fish and other animals like to eat. So I'm going to very quickly talk about some of the science we've done on the impacts of this trash floating around. And, uh, and then we can get to what we can do about it partially. Um, so one thing that um, my group, myself and my co-authors did uh, is we went basically went back in time uh, through and looked at all the data that was on plastic in the North Pacific between the years 1972 and 1988. And we were able to do that because where I did grad school, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, has a library of samples that were taken and stored there. So these were, people weren't interested in looking at plastic necessarily then, but they still took samples like we did from the surface of the ocean in a scientific and way that we could compare it to samples we are taken now. So we looked through all those samples, uh, we looked through all the scientific literature, and we found that there was basically this much plastic somewhere between those two years. So the colors relate to the amount of plastic, the number of particles on the surface. The warmer the color, the more plastic there is. And where it's white, we don't have any data. So we only have data from these three areas. Um, so you can still see, if you remember the big white spot that I showed you on the wind map, it's right here. So here's that area that they term the Eastern Garbage Patch. So there's still some plastic here, even just 20 years after plastic became used as a consumer product. Yes? How did the big pieces of plastic get down to be little teeny pieces of plastic? Oh, an excellent question. So the question was, how did big pieces of plastic become teeny pieces of plastic? Um, and that, that happens when uh, they're exposed to UV light in the sun. 
if plastic is plastic is very very sensitive to UV light and so it becomes brittle with time in the sun and then uh, as it's moved by the waves it basically crumbles so we would pick out for example like those crates that we saw floating by and you pick them out and you would just have plastic crumbs going all the way down your arms because they would crumble in your hands so that's how there's some scientific controversy, which if anyone really cares, I can talk about after, um, about how, how exactly that happens, but that's the general idea. So anyway, um, so here's the amount of plastic in 1972 through 1988, and then here's the amount of plastic today. Um, it has increased by 100 times uh, in that four decade period. We can't tell from this data how fast it's increasing now, because unfortunately we just don't have a good comparison. Um, but we can tell that between those two time periods, mm. the amount of plastic, particularly in this area, under the North Pacific High, has increased by 100 times. So it used to be green 0.1 piece per cubic meter of surface water, and now it's 10 in some areas. So it is increasing, or it has increased. <coughs> and um, as I mentioned, the plastic is the same size as some of the fish, the food that fish eat. And but work based on work that some of my colleagues did at Scripps, uh, Pete Davis and Rebecca Ash, they found that around 9% of the fish that are living in these high plastic areas had ingested pieces of plastic. Now these are not the fish that we eat. These are big, little teeny fish called lanternfish or mctophids that are a very important link between zooplankton and larger fish. So basically, it's not about nice to be a mctophid. You're basically food for everything else. But um, they're very, very important to the ecology of the open ocean. So here's what they look like. They're little, they're about this big. Um, and then here's a piece of plastic that was found in their stomach. Um, some invertebrates, animals without backbones, are also ingesting plastic. Yes? You talk about this being on the surface, mm -hmm. but how deep does it go? Oh, an excellent question. Thank you for asking. So the question was, how deep does it go? And the answer is, we don't know. Most of it is on the surface on calm days. Um, and that is something that we were able to measure in 2009. Uh, because, but when the wind kicks up, it mixes below the surface, um, and that then it can be found deeper in the water column, which is some very nice work that was done by uh, some folks at Sea Education Association in Woods Hole. Um, there is also uh, there are also pieces that are making it to the deeper ocean, and we know that because we caught a fish called a hatchet fish that never comes up to the surface, and it had eaten a piece of plastic. So that plastic got down there somewhere, uh, got down there somehow. Um, so there is some going down there, but we don't know how much, and that's a big piece of missing information right now. Um, so some invertebrates are also eating plastic. Uh, this is a copepod um, that I actually did this on purpose to this poor copepod. I, I did some experiments in the lab and fed them, uh, tried to feed them pieces of plastic to see if they would eat it that fluoresce under black light. So that is, this is a piece of plastic inside that copepod's gut. Calinus pacificus, if any, there are any marine scientists in the audience. And this is a fecal pellet. From a uh, uh, from a probably a krill, and this is also a piece of plastic that had been eaten by the krill and then ingested, as the polite term says. Um, also, um, these barnacles, the gooseneck barnacles, on work that we hopefully have coming out really soon. These barnacles are also eating plastic. About 33% of the ones we caught on living on the surface um, were had plastic in their guts. Yes. But it sounds as if the plastic not then automatically kill an, uh, an animal that is ingested. It does not automatically kill them. That is correct. We don't know exactly what effect it has. Some of them are able to pass it. The barnacles showed no evidence of harm. They had plastic in their stomachs, but the plastic was of a size that it probably, if uh, we hadn't killed them, they probably would have been able to pass the plastic out of their system. Some of the concerns have to do with toxins over time. Uh, the plastic has high levels of toxins basically stuck to the surface. Um, and these are both toxins that are in the plastic material sometimes as additives, and toxins that get stuck on it due to the chemical nature of plastic in the ocean. And these are really nasty things like PCBs and DDTs that get stuck onto the surface. So the thought is that plastic ingestion, even if it just is passed out of the system, could lead to higher levels of toxins in these animals. And that's work that other scientists are working on really hard right now to figure out if that's going on. So um, everyone always asks me if this can be cleaned up. Um, and I sort of like, I don't like to be a big downer, um, but I will just say, I, and to hurt people's creativity, I'll just say there is many obstacles to clean up of tiny pieces of plastic over hundreds of thousands of square miles of the ocean surface. Because 
First of all, it's a huge area. I like to use this picture in the background. It's taken with a fisheye lens. Here's the ship, here's some people, and this is the ocean, and here's our tiny little net uh, that we use to collect the plastic. So it sounds like a cliche, but it's actually really hard to imagine just how big the ocean is. It's really, really big. Um, and our nets are really, really small, and we burn fossil fuel for the most part to run them. Uh, and you, so you have this huge area, the plastic's very small. Uh, when you're using a net fine enough to catch the plastic, you're also catching the zooplankton and other and small baby fish. And so even in the most heavy plastic areas, we would catch an equal amount of light, of sea life for every amount of plastic. So you have a lot of collateral damage. And that doesn't really matter when we're just doing a little teeny net tow. Uh, but if you wanted to take the whole surface of the ocean, that is a big deal. And finally, it would be very expensive. Uh, you cannot sail in these areas because it's the big white spot. There's not much wind. It's the not easy to sail. If you're, even if you're on a sailboat, you're going to have to motor. It means you're burning fossil fuel and you're spending money for diesel. Um, the medium-sized Scripps research vessel we're on costs about $20,000 a day, mostly just in diesel. And so the cost to do the entire North Pacific would be, frankly, prohibitive. So there are some issues to deal with before we can think about cleaning it up. So are there technological solutions? Yes? I'm not sure I can explain exactly what I want to say, mm -hmm. but you have a big rock, mm -hmm. and it breaks into small pieces eventually to sink. Mm -hmm. So you'd eventually have, you'd have a big piece of plastic, which would eventually turn into little pieces, mm -hmm. which would be plastic sand. And at some point, I mean, fish and whatever don't eat sand, would they at some point not eat the plastic? And that's a good question. Um, so the question was, uh, would the plastic get so small that it would not matter anymore? Is that is that an accurate? Yes. Yeah. Would it be sand? Yeah. Yeah. Would it be sand? Yeah. Well, the problem with sand is that it will always float. So the plastic that we see floating in the ocean is plastic that floats. There is plastic that sinks, it just doesn't make it out to the middle of the ocean. It's sitting off here, unfortunately, like never going anywhere. But so we, with the plastic that, so it floats, it will probably never stop floating unless it gets so much sea life growing on it that that makes it sink. So it will never, the, the plastics that are already sinking could turn into sand, absolutely. And you see that in Hawaii, unfortunately, in some places. Um, the plastics that are floating will just get smaller and smaller, and it is a huge open question what that actually does. Um, they provide a home for different microbes to live on than would normally live in the open ocean, and that's a big area of concern and of research right now. So I don't think you could say that they would definitely get so small that they would have no effect. You can say as they get smaller, they would have different and new and exciting effects, but those would... Um, not necessarily be positive, although it would not necessarily be negative either. I don't want to say that it, this will kill everything, because it, it won't, but um, it can have surprising and different effects that we may not desire. So we don't know yet. Stay tuned, stay tuned, science is on the case. Um, yes? What are some of the major origins and sources when they pass the pollution? It's, once they're that small, you can't tell. Oh, sorry, the question was, uh, what are the sources? And the answer is land and sea, probably uh, many, a lot of us to some degree. Uh, we, the ma two major sources are land-based sources, which is basically litter and improper disposal and accidental loss. Like, you know, when a trash can at the beach turns over, people meant to do the right thing, but it still gets into the ocean. And then there's just litter bugs. Um, for example, in California, with the Mediterranean climate, People litter into the canyons all year long, and then when the rains come in the winter, it washes all that trash right into the ocean. Uh, at sea losses are primarily fishing gear, and in Maine, that is, so far as I know, the primary kind of marine debris locally, which is lost, lost or discarded fishing gear. Um, and we see that in the North Pacific too with the buoys and nets. But once it's small, we just don't know where it came from. We can tell what kind of plastic it is, like polyethylene, polystyrene, which is basically the recycling number, but we can't say, oh, that was a bucket and someone bought it at Target in, in 2011. Um, one of the things that I tried and completely failed to do in my thesis, although there's a great chapter on how I failed, um, is to figure out how long the plastic has been in the ocean. Um, to, to say, okay, this little piece has been in the ocean for five years or 10 years, because then we could run some of the models backwards and tell where it came from. But unfortunately, uh, well, although I failed in new and exciting ways, uh, hopefully other people will learn from that and uh, maybe we'll figure out a way, but I did not. 
Um, so I can talk more about that if anyone's interested. I'm gonna, I have about two more slides on different kinds of solutions and then I'll just open it up for questions. Um, so you hear the term bioplastics sometimes. Bioplastics are plastics that instead of being from petroleum are from sources like sugarcane or corn, but chemically they are identical to petroleum derived plastic. They're absolutely identical. So they're gonna do the same thing in the ocean. So they might be a solution to using less petroleum products, but they are not a solution to plastic in the ocean. Uh, you might have seen these greenware, which is made out of compostable corn-based polymers, or PLA is the technical term. Again, these will not biodegrade in the ocean. They will only biodegrade in industrial compost. They won't even biodegrade in your backyard compost, which I can personally attest to you, being a scientist, I tried. Um, but my worms did not like them. You need, you need a high level of heat to break down the corn-based polymer, and most people's backyard compost don't get that hot. So, in, again, in the ocean, that won't help. Um, there is a method, there is a company called Method that made uh, products out of plastic that they basically pulled off the beach in Hawaii um, and turned into a recycled product. And so that was a very important development in being able to reuse that weathered plastic, but uh, I, I don't think it was not profitable for them. They did it as a public service, so until companies are making money at that, uh, it's probably not going to be large scale. So they're still waiting. If there could be a technological solution, but there isn't right now. Um, people have sought legislative solutions, which I, by the way, in my uh, current position, cannot have any opinion on, but I will simply tell you about them, and you can form your own opinions. Um, so uh, people have tried their plastic bag bans in some municipalities, uh, San Francisco, Austin, Seattle, Los Angeles, other countries. There have been many proposed statewide bans of plastic bags, and all of them have failed. Um, so there is no statewide or federal, or federal level legislation on this right now. Um, there are fees in some areas instead of a ban, so they charge five or ten cents for a bag. And I live in DC and it's a five cent charge, or ten cent? I forget, because I bring my own bags because I don't want to pay the tax. Yeah. <laughs> and even though it's a really not a large amount of money, who wants to pay a tax? Not me. So their bag fees are one thing that people have done. Uh, certain municipalities have banned water bottles or polystyrene, mostly in California. Um, currently, there are uh, lots of bag bans or bag taxes being considered on state and state legislatures. Um, Maine is considering a bag tax, or at least it, I believe it is in committee in the state legislature right now, and I'm not entirely sure. So we'll, it will remain to be seen if any of those will go forward. Uh, bag ban, I recently live in California, so it's what I'm most familiar with. A bag ban has failed three times in California. So it um, remains to be seen if other states will be more progressive. I mean, uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't hear that. Careful. Didn't hear that. <laughs> um, other solutions are uh, prevention, um, just stopping plastic from going into the ocean in the first place. And that's what most people who work in this issue think will be most effective. Um, because once it's in the ocean, it's really hard to get it back out again. So these include beach cleanups, improving infrastructure like storm drains that filter out the trash before it gets into the rivers or into the um, ocean. Recycling, improving recycling programs, in particular education and outreach. Uh, there's a, there's a, education, a great education outreach called Rosalia Project that functions in the Gulf of Maine. They also do some cleanup. They have this little uh, sailboat. They sail around and they look for plastic with ROVs and clean it up and they do a lot. They sail around to ports and do talk to people about this issue. Um, and uh, the, uh, in Blue Hill, the, let's see if I get this right, Marine Ecological Research Institute. Oh, curses. Marine Environmental Research Institute in Blue Hill, just down the road from here, is doing a citizen science project on microplastic in the Gulf of Maine. So uh, there is local work that's ongoing on this too, raising awareness and also understanding what the problem is. So um, just to conclude, um, one, small bright side of this is that this issue of plastic in the ocean has really caused people to think about what is in the ocean and how wonderful these open ocean places that most people will never go are. So most people, these and these are all pictures that my crew uh, took in 2009. So these are actual pictures of the North Pacific Gyre as well. So you shouldn't think of it as synonymous with trash, but as a really amazing place in the ocean that happens to have a little trash problem right now, which hopefully we will find a solution to. Um, so thank you so much for coming, and I'd love to take your questions.
saw China and Mexico were also on your list, but uh, is there any global effort by one organization to coordinate all these things, or is it just done locally? Because um, China and Mexico have a severe <coughs> trash problem, yeah. as does Taiwan, Malaysia, et cetera. Absolutely. And it just, I don't know who's worse, whether, I know we all contribute to it, but I don't know which Asia or the, or our side is, is worse, one is worse than the other, yeah. but is there any global group that's being formed to address this? And short answer is no. Um, longer answer is, yeah, I mean, developing countries have severe trash manager problems. Because until even there, maybe 30 years ago there, they did not have trash that didn't biodegrade or didn't right. go anywhere. So they don't have the systems to deal with it. Um, so that's really a problem. Uh, the United Nations does have an environmental program that cert does do work on marine debris, but the United Nations does not really do that kind of global work. So that is the closest thing that I'm aware of. Um, other, so right now, at best, it's on a country by country basis. Um, the, and most of those countries that have banned various kinds of plastic has been the most problematic. I believe in China, it is the very, very thin film plastic bags. It's not all plastic bags, it's a particular kind. So slowly, people are realizing this is a problem, but it, it definitely is. We, we remain to be better coordinated uh, on possible solutions. Um, did you want to Plastic ask? bag follow-up. Plastic bag follow-up, all right, <laughs> go for it. Um, my question is, a lot of this legislation is so focused on plastic bags. Yeah. Do you have any idea? what proportion of the plastic pollution in the ocean is actually coming from that source? Are we just doing it because it's something we feel we can do and it makes us feel better? Well, plastic bags coastally are a big problem. And, and, and on land and in close to the coast. So you see a lot more plastic bag solutions there where you're thin cases, and again, in developing countries where, for example, domestic animals, which are very important to people, eat plastic bags and die, and that's a big problem. But in the North Pacific Jar, way offshore, they are not a significant component of the plastic. Um, and that is probably because they break down pretty fast in the sunlight. And so they break down too small for us to notice them by the time they get out there. So I think people see it as low-hanging fruit um, for plastic bags. Um, but no, it's not a significant component of oceanic debris. Um, yes, in the stripy shirt. Hi. Um, I noticed that Barnes & Noble have uh, they created biodegradable bags that kind of crumble. Is that effective in presenting, in preventing the gyre? <coughs> biodegradable bags, it really depends what you mean by biodegradable. And um, there are some that are basically bits of plastic stuck together by cornstarch. And so the cornstarch breaks down, so it's not a bag anymore. Um, but there's still all these little pieces of plastic that go off. Um, and that's not that helpful. I mean, it might be helpful if you had like domestic animals eating them and dying problems, but it's not that helpful for just plastic pollution in the ocean. If they are truly biodegradable, it is kind of helpful just to you know break things down. But again, if it goes to the landfill, it's not going to make any difference because unless it's actually in a system where microbes can work, it's not. Nothing is really going to happen. So um, I would say it's a good first step to get people to think about it. But I really hope it's the second kind and not the first kind. <laughs> you had a question. What other known, known places do you know about that are in the world that have place, uh, trash, large trash in the ocean? Um, the other place in the world that definitely has a problem is the North Atlantic. Uh, that is well known because North Atlantic is conveniently located off of Woods Hole. Um, and so there's been, a <laughs> and there's been a lot more work done just looking at the ocean there. Um, so they also have a trash accumulation problem in the North Atlantic with tropical gyre. There is almost certainly trash accumulating in the three southern hemispheres of tropical gyres, so South Atlantic, South Pacific, and Indian. Um, it's just that uh, the, there is just less work on big, expensive research vessels down there. There's a nonprofit group called Five Gyres that went to go sample all of them, and they did find plastic in all of them. Um, it was sort of hard for them to tell how much because they were on a little sailboat and they ran into some bad conditions, so that remains to be seen. Um, so, uh, but probably. Probably there is. Um, in the back. Uh, how common is it for coastal cities around the globe to be dumping their, all of their trash in the ocean today, as even New York City was doing until fairly recently? 
Um, the official rules on ocean dumping of plastic were changed in 1989, so it's Marple Annex 5 for Van Buren sailors. Um, so until then, it was perfectly legal for everyone to dump their trash a certain distance offshore. And in fact, I've been told by some of these Scripps professors from who were working there uh, before that rule change that the, our research vessels would also chuck it off the side. And I was just like, oh God. <laughs> but you know, it was, it was not on people's radar, it's a problem. Um, now in the United States, I don't think it's significant. Um, I mean, there's, there's littering and that's a problem, but it is definitely not allowed. And on the, all the ships that I've been on, people have taken it pretty seriously. Although, of course, I've been on those ships doing research on this. So, um, in, the, in, the, in the rest of the world, I just, I just don't know, especially in the developing world. I just can't. I, don't, I just don't know. Um, in the back of the blue shirt. Any, any research on these plastic companies where they can mix this plastic so little animals can eat it? <laughs> I'm sorry, could you say Okay. That? Is there any research by the plastic companies where they can add something to the plastics so these little microbes could actually eat it and digest mm -hmm. it? Yeah, so no, that's a really good question. So in um, case, I'll just repeat it in my thunderous voice. Um, can you add things to plastic so that um, microbes will eat it and biodegrade it? And the answer is pro there are plastics in development that are biodegradable. And they're, they're just very expensive. So there's one, I'm forgetting its name. It's called like, it starts with an M, and I can't remember what it's called. But it was in development as used basically for uh, fishing to make a little door in traps so that if they got lost, that little panel would biodegrade and um, it wouldn't, they, they wouldn't have ghost lobster traps or ghost crab pots. But the, the, it's so much more expensive than regular plastic that it would not come into consumer usage. And then the other issue, even if we did solve the cost problem, which is one of the reasons to use plastic is because it doesn't biodegrade. And for example, especially when we're working in like salt water, I mean, I would be really hate for my glasses to be made out of biodegradable material, like that would be terrible. Um, so there are reasons that we don't want it to be used, and especially with boats that are made out of fiberglass. Um, so, so it wouldn't, even if we had it, it wouldn't be work for all materials. Yes? This all sounds pretty depressing. Sorry. Ah, can you tell us some of the good things that have come about? Because I know there are. <laughs> Actually, I can. Allow me to introduce you to one of my favorite bugs. Um, let's find it. Uh, this guy. So, meet um, the sea skater, <laughs> Halibati sericus. A very charming bug. Um, you can't, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that you aren't charmed by this little guy. Um, so, uh, sea skaters are uh, insects that live in the open ocean and skate along on the surface like pond skaters, which they're closely related to, but they spend their whole life in the open ocean. But because they're evolved for pond skaters, their eggs sink. So, here's what their eggs look like. They're little grains of rice. And due to the rise of plastic in the ocean, sea skaters now have more places to lay their eggs and are thriving. Um, so I <laughs> yes. Um, so if you really like sea skaters, uh, this is good news. Now I don't know what effects this will have ultimately on the larger ocean food web, um, but it's definitely good for the sea skaters. And they are a native species; they're not invasive. So um, and I think they're really cute. Um, so <laughs> that is my good news. There are good things. There are good things. I mean, it all is relative, right? I mean, if you're a sea skater, it's good. If you're a little fish, it's bad. Right, exactly. And not dumping cruise ships anymore. I mean, there's a whole right. bunch of that stuff. Say right. some of that. And, and more seriously, um, I think that this issue has really raised public awareness of all kinds of pollution in the ocean, not just plastic, which is, is absolutely a positive. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, you've had your hand up for a long time. How much, <coughs> me, how much research has been done on the effects on sea life, if you will, of ingesting this? I've indicated that it seems to be digested and just pass on through, but have they done any um, research on what the effects of the chemicals that are in the plastic have on the creatures themselves over the long term? <laughs> um, not over the long term, but yeah, this is this is research is in its infancy. Oh, sorry. The question was, is there research on the effects of ingestion other than death? And I should specify actually, there's a lot of research on ingestion in large animals that people tend to notice more. So, 
uh, whales, dolphins, seals, sea turtles, and seabirds, and they definitely eat plastic and a lot of them die from it. So it's a really big problem in those animals. Um, those animals just don't live in large quantities in the North Pacific gyre, which is why I didn't talk about them that much, although the albatross is a notable exception. Um, for the other long-term effects of ingestion, yes, there's ongoing research right now that's just, it's really starting to, just getting started, but it seems like, and this is work that was done by my colleague Chelsea Rockman, just to give her credit, um, and she looked at, she's a toxicologist, and she fed little lab rat fish, so they're like just little lab fish, plastic, <laughs> and they had weird effects in their liver even if the plastic wasn't, didn't have toxins on it. So there might be some effects there. She's still working on that. That's still ongoing. So it's very, very early. But it seems like just ingesting plastic has the potential to be bad. So scientists are looking into it right now. So it's a sort of a stay tuned. Like people are aware of the issue, but the work is still ongoing. So yeah, I have a question over here. Yes. Is anything being done in terms of preventative education for the young? Because they're coming up and they're the ones that are really can take, you know, take yeah. charge. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work trying to raise awareness. There are many nonprofit groups that do a lot of awareness raising. I mean, Algalita, Five Gyres, uh, Rosalia. Um, I know that there's going to be more, and I'm going to get in trouble because I can't think of them off the top of my head. But there are lots of nonprofits that try to raise awareness on this issue. Oh, uh, the uh, Ocean Conservancy does a lot of work with marine oh, yeah. debris. Yeah. Who did they, did they go into the public <laughs> schools? I don't know exactly what they do. Um, they do do a lot of work with the coastal cleanup, which they bring a lot of school groups in to do the beach cleanups and just say oh, this yeah. is a problem. Yeah. Um, so I think there is a lot of work. Oh, there's been various art projects with like having kids construct like art, like find go and find trash, and they make like art out of the trash to like so to to raise awareness that this is yeah. a problem. So there are a lot of projects. They're just it's it's very grassroots. So. In some areas, there's a lot of awareness, like in Hawaii, where they have an enormous trash problem that isn't their fault, that comes from the ocean. Um, and there is less awareness in other areas that perhaps it's not as visible. So um, if it's something that you're interested, that anyone here is interested in, there are a lot of resources out there, something you're interested in, sort of pointing your own community towards. Yes? You've heard a lot in the news about debris that came from the tsunami in Japan making its way mm -hmm. to the American shores. Is this, are these separate currents and, and that these various sources of, of trash and debris are not intersecting in any way? Because they seem to be behaving quite differently. Um, they are the same currents, but they are different sizes of debris and that's how they, why they behave differently. So again, I apologize for this map being so washed out. Um, but you can sort of at least see the arrowheads. So the, here's Japan, and this is, here's the North Pacific Current. So this is the current that the debris fell off Japan for the tsunami and came across in the North Pacific Current, which actually splits and part of it would go down California, and part of it hit Vancouver, Oregon, Washington. Sorry, uh, British Columbia, Oregon, and Washington. And the reason that the tsunami debris went like that is because it was big stuff that was pushed by the wind. So this is the jet stream coming across here in various wiggly ways. So if it had a lot of windage, or for those again who are, who are sailors, it's sticking up above the water, it gets scudded across really fast in the wind. Um, if it doesn't have a lot of windage, like those little plastic pieces, it sort of floats slowly along in the water. The sad part about this whole situation, along with the tsunami, is there is so much trash in the ocean anyway, you cannot tell very easily what comes from the tsunami with the notable exceptions of the, thing that, the things that have made it into the media, like Dock in Oregon, that soccer ball that was signed by someone's classmates. So there are some things that certainly did come from it, but when you just have like a, a buoy or some gear wash up, like you can't necessarily say. So as of a couple months ago, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration had only identified 31 pieces of debris that had, they had positively identified were from the tsunami. So, um, that is, it's just hard to tell. Does that answer your question? It's a question for this section? Yeah. I heard recently that scientists in Japan are developing a way to make gasoline and oil out of plastic. Have you heard anything about that? I have seen probably the same video that you have seen of the very nice gentleman with his machine. Yes. Um, <laughs> Again, I hate to be like such a downer all the time, but I've been hearing about these machines now for five or six years, and it never seems to make it past the development stage. It just makes me think economically, 
there's a problem or because if people could make oil out of plastic, God, I'd take it to the dump right now. I mean, that's when people come to me with these things. I'm like, don't take it to the ocean. Take it to your town dump. Make a lot of money, then take it to the ocean. Yeah. So the fact that this has not occurred makes me somewhat skeptical, but technological problems can be solved and uh, issues of, you know, maybe there's a, a way that can make it profitable and I, I await with great joy that day. But right now, I don't have any information, and I, I, I am skeptical that it is cost effective now. Uh, question from this section, anyone? Or back? Anyway. Okay, yeah. This may be outside your area of sure. knowledge. But if uh, the debris from the Japanese tsunami came across, would it be radioactive? And could you figure out that that was from, J from the Japanese tsunami? So, the, 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 yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, the question is, is, would the debris from the tsunami be radioactive and could you identify it that way? And the answer is no. It would not be radioactive because it was people's houses and stuff that just got washed into the ocean with the tsunami. So it was not sitting bathed in the radioactive water that was accidentally released. So it would, pro it would not be radioactive unless it was some kind of thing that was actually from the nuclear plant. Um, as a side note, uh, there has been some coverage of the radioactivity issues in the North Pacific, and I wanted to be clear that nobody who works on the North Pacific circulation thinks that we're likely to get really problematic uh, problematic levels of radiation in the U.S. That there's the the ocean again is so big, uh, the new, the radiation gets diluted, so we can detect it because we're really good at detecting radiation. We can detect micro tiny amounts of radiation, but currently the levels are not hazardous uh, on the U.S except for just off the coast of Japan. Um, so it is not something that we're concerned about right now in the US. I just wanted to say that because I've, I've been getting concerned emails from my relatives about this. So, <laughs> um, and there are people monitoring, there are scientists monitoring it now, so we will know if that changes. Yes? So Miriam, just to, to give people an idea here, so at College of the Atlantic and at Mary, who you, you talked about, we've, we've measured microplastic, which is really, really tiny mm -hmm. stuff. and. In a liter of water, if you take go down to the dock and take a liter of water, you get an average of 40 pieces of tiny plastic here. Right here in May. Here in, off the COA dock in Blue Hill, Great Duck, not Desert Rock. Tiny, tiny pieces, and they're almost all filaments. <laughs> and so they're probably not plastic bags. Right. That seems like, it seems like a... Uh, Fishing and dock related here, yeah. And, it, and at Mary, they actually get a little bit higher level, they get a significantly higher level when they're off their sewage outfall. So, um, oh, yeah. another potential is yeah. all your fleece clothing that yeah. gets washed. Um, and so, plastic bags are, are important, but there's a lot of different ways that can contribute to this issue. No, that's absolutely, and thank you uh, for, for saying that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and that was actually uh, Mark Brown, who did, when he was working in the UK as a researcher, who did that, like, some, he was, looked at some of those fibers and stormwater drains in the UK and found that same connection, which is really depressing, especially for those of us in New England, that police clothing does that when you, when you launder it. So there are many <clears throat> other sources. So, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where I'm, it's, 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 um, Something that I guess we all have to think about how we can develop better materials that don't do that because the genie is out of the bottle on plastic being a common substance. So, yeah, now I'm depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes, in the back. What's the time cycle that a, a, a square centimeter of plastic? goes down to microscopic size? Um, it depends. Um, depends on the level of sunlight and agitation. So there is no one, uh, one uh, there's not a, an inherent relationship in time, unfortunately, which is one thing that I also discovered as I failed to do this. Um, so it really depends on the amount of sunlight and the strength of the sunlight. So the uh, salt, uh, salt water does not, uh, it helps me with the sun and no. Does the salt water have anything to do with plastic? Does it? It, it helps in the wrong it? direction. So the hotter the plastic is, the more it breaks down. So if something is on the beach getting very, very hot, um, it breaks down faster physically, never chemically, just uh, into crumbling into little pieces. 
Um, but if it's in the ocean, it can only get as hot as the ocean water, which nowhere in the world is extremely hot. So it actually slows the process by being in the ocean. I know. See, now I'm depressing everybody again. <laughs> um, there, is there another question over here? Yes. This is a, a Larry Summers question. Uh-oh. Uh, apropos of what he was saying, um, most of what we find in the Gulf of Maine are containers, not bags. And if we went back to, have there been any economic studies about going back to wood, metal, any of the other materials that were used for containers, because the large volume of plastic debris are containers, particularly here. Yeah, well, that's a good question. And the question was uh, if there have been any studies about using metal and wood for containers as opposed to plastic. I am not aware of any specifically on containers, although I wouldn't necessarily be. There might be out there, I just might not be aware of them. I mean, I think that we, it would be something that it would be the law of unintended consequences that it would have to be really carefully considered because if the demand for wood goes way up, that wood has to come from somewhere. Um, so it would be, not, again, not to say you couldn't do it, but it would have to be a careful cost-benefit analysis of what the cost would be of growing all that wood, where would it come from, and uh, can we you know, do it in a sustainable fashion. I suspect that, again, the genie's out of the bottle on that, too. Uh, I suspect that now that we have plastic, wood, and metal would be cost prohibitive without some pretty serious regulation. I forgot glass. Sorry. Oh, and glass. Yeah, yes. absolutely. But I, I suspect that plastic right now is so much cheaper compared to other materials that without some kind of um, mechanism for making that not true, I think it would be very difficult to change materials. But if we each do it individually? I mean... <laughs> Yeah, if, you, if everyone refuses to buy anything that wasn't shipped in a wooden container, uh, we would all have a lot less stuff to sell at yard sales. <laughs> um, um, is there any other questions? Well, thank you all so much for coming, and if you have any more, I'll